this uh, lecture was established uh, uh, to commemorate the memory of uh, a great historian and a great mentor by his colleagues, uh, his students, uh, and his friends. Uh, this is our fourth uh, lecture, and uh, hopefully the lecture series will continue for as long as AB is there. Uh, uh, today, our lecturer is Professor Shafat Pamuk. The name Pamuk, of course, perhaps needs no introduction. Uh, on account of uh, the two Pamuks, Shavkat as well as Orhan. Uh, uh, professor Shavkat Pamuk is a professor of economics uh, and economic history at Bogaziji University. Bogaziji University is Bosphorus University. And uh, as uh, my friend and colleague Deringel says, is a sister institution to AUB. Uh, Professor Pamuk is a leading economic historian of the Ottoman Empire, the Middle East, and Europe, and has published a great deal, many books, in fact, including the Ottoman Empire and the European Capitalism, 1820 to 1913, this Cambridge University Press, a monetary history of the Ottoman Empire, and this book, I think, was translated into Arabic uh, as well. Uh, he was professor and chair for contemporary Turkish studies at the London School of Economics from 2008 to 2013. He served as president of the European Historical Economic Society from 2003 and 2005. He also served as president of Asian Historical Economic Society 2012-2014. And he is co-editor of the European Review of Economic History and is a member of Academia Europea and Science Academy Istanbul. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Pamuk. Thank you. I am honored to be here this evening to give this talk in honor of a distinguished historian, Professor Kemal Salibi. I would like to thank the Department of History and Archaeology and Professor Abu Hussein for this invitation. And I would like to also thank my good friend Mehmed Ali Nezi for all his assistance in recent months. Well, we will have to. Okay. Can we do? Yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll find a, okay, thank you. Um, we'll find our way. Okay, let me see. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I am going to talk about plagues and the history of the Middle East uh, this evening. And uh, more specifically, there were these three worldwide pandemics. One in the beginning in the 6th century, the other one beginning in the 14th century, and there, is a, there was a third one that began in the 19th century. I'll, I will be talking about the first two uh, this evening. And uh, I thought 
before I begin, I should try to explain a little why I chose to talk about plagues. You see here the, these three pandemics. They all originated in Asia, but then went through the Middle East and Europe. These were not one-off <coughs> events. Each of these uh, occurred for a period, initial period of three, four years, but they kept recurring. And each of these two pandemics literally lasted for centuries. And the population of the Middle East and Europe declined anywhere from one-fourth to one-third. And by, according to some accounts, by even a larger fraction during each of these episodes. Well, his, uh, historians of other regions have been interested in these episodes, and historians of the Middle East have also written about these uh, events, but in my opinion, not sufficiently. In, in my opinion, there is a lot to be learned from these pandemics and especially about the longer term consequences of them. So uh, if you look today at what has been written about uh, the Black Death and the Justinian plague, of which more later, you find that historiography related to the Middle East has focused on demographic history, has focused on medical history, intellectual history, but there has been very little on social and economic history of these episodes. So I will be focusing more on them. And, uh, well, basically, I will not be talking about the dead. I'll be talking about those who lived and what difference it made for those who survived these pandemics. And of course, this is an opportunity uh, to talk about the Middle East in a global context. And I think that's one appeal for me, why I chose to talk about uh, uh, this, to this topic this evening. And I hope uh, thinking about the, these pandemics will provide some new insights to the history of our region. And of course, Professor Salibi had wide-ranging interests, and he was very much interested in, in different periods. So I hope this will be a fitting tribute to his memory and to his, to his work. Well, very simply, there is a bacterium called Yersinia pestis, and this is the common element in these three pandemics. This bacterium lives on rodents, rats, mice, squirrels, and then uh, travels with them. This bacterium travels in ships on rats, on trade routes. And this is how the disease was transmitted. And then, of course, the fleas then move from rats and, uh, well, basically rats and mice, to humans, and this is how the humans catch the disease, primarily. Again, I'm not so much interested in the medical aspects, but I will try to focus in my limited time on the social and economic history, but I do want to give you some sense of each of those two episodes, and I will begin with the Black Death, because uh, more is known about the Black Death, and more, there has been more studies, including uh, studies on the Middle East. Again, the Black Death uh, 
uh, originated in the 14th century from Asia to the Middle East and then uh, to through the Middle East, Constantinople, Cairo, um, Damascus, and so on, and then on to Europe. And of course, just to remind you, Asia at the time was united by the Mongols, and in fact, the unity of Asia helped transmit the disease towards Europe. The fact that the trade routes through Asia were working, at the, were active at this time, it made a big difference. And you can see here from Constantinople, it was transmitted very quickly to Cyprus, Cairo, and then to Italy, and on to, uh, on to Southern Europe, Western Europe. And within a period of two, three, four years, you can see most of the continent was, uh, fell under the, the pandemic. But the, the one point I want to make about these episodes is that they, these, these pandemics were not limited to a short period at the beginning they kept coming back. In the case uh, of uh, we Western Europe, the recurrences lasted until the end of the 16th century. For Southern Europe, for Italy, for example, recurrences, the, let's say the uh, Black Death, the pandemic kept re com coming back until the 17th century. And very interestingly, for our part of the world, around the Mediterranean, this, the disease persisted until the 19th century, until the 1840s. So th there is already a big puzzle here. Why is it that it, the, it disappeared earlier in uh, Western Mediterranean, Western Europe, but it persisted here, and it persisted also in Russia until much later date. Some uh, historians, also medical historians, have argued that the quarantine was one reason for this glaring uh, difference, but uh, I think this is subject to debate. But at any case, the Black Death was in this part of the world, in this part of the Mediterranean until the 1840s. And uh, for that reason, there is a huge difference between Eastern Mediterranean, what happened in the Eastern Mediterranean, and, the, and uh, what happened in Southern and Western Europe during the so-called early modern era. Now, I may be one of the first to point to this contrast in what had to the population growth of the Middle East and the rest of uh, the world's leading regions during the early modern centuries, from 16th to 19th century. These are my numbers I have uh, gathered from basic population almanacs, population uh, handbooks, and so on. You can see how the, not only the population of Europe, but the population of India, South Asia, and China have doubled, tripled, more than tripled in the case of Europe, from 1500 to 1820. But the population of Europe barely increased during these three centuries. Okay. So why was this so? Can we link this to the persistence of the disease? I think we can. I think we should. But if you look at the historiography, you will not see very much discussion of this. So this is one of the things I think we need to Think about demographic. It makes a huge difference. It brings, I think, an important new perspective to the demographic history of our region to think about the Black Death. And there have been some important books, some recently. These are, these are the four books that I tend to think about when I think about uh, 
uh, black that in the Middle East by dolls. That's a classic. Uh, was the study the initial, the first three four years of the impact of the disease in Egypt? Stuart Borsch talked. They made a comparison more recently about Egypt and England, the impact of the disease and the contrast. Daniel Panzak, again wrote uh, more than 30 years ago about the later period uh, of, the, of the disease in, across the Ottoman Empire, including northern Africa, the Maghreb. And Nuket Varlak recently uh, reminded everyone else in her award-winning uh, dissertation about that the, the plague occurred because I have to say that historians of the Middle East and especially historians of the Ottoman Empire have ignored the Black Death for too long. And the second plague is the earlier one, is called the Justinian Plague because the initial outbreak was during the reign of Justinian in the 6th century. But as you can see here, again, this uh, plague traveled from East Asia, again, through trade routes to the Middle East. But then it traveled through Middle East, Constantinople, but to Southern Europe, Western Europe, as far as Ireland and the British Isles. Just to remind you, at the time of the initial outbreak, in this part of the world was the Byzantine Empire. Okay. And then the plague, here is a summary of the recurrences of the plague. You can see on the horizontal axis the years in which the recurrences occurred, and they go all the way to the 8th century. And of course, by the 8th century, the political map had changed considerably. The Byzantine Empire now, by the 8th century, in the 7th, 8th centuries, is much smaller. And then we have the uh, Islamic Empire and the Golden Age of Islam. So um, when I talk about the social and economic consequences of the plague, I do want to focus a little bit, spend a little bit of time, what the plague may have meant for this early period in Islamic history and the, the, the so-called Golden Age. Um, but there is also uh, more to, to the Justinian plague. Part of it is speculation, but part of it is also just, is, there is already uh, mentioned in the literature that, of course, the Justinian plague was an important reason why the Byzantine Empire weakened significantly in the 6th century. Just the era of Justinian was, in fact, in many ways, the zenith of the uh, Byzantine Empire, and the Byzantine historians are, uh, well, most of them agree that this was a very important event for the Byzantine Empire. But by the same token, the weakening of the Byzantine Empire demographically, and then as a result militarily, and again as a result fiscally, the idea that they could not collect the taxes to maintain their armies made a big difference in terms of the expansion of Islam in the seventh, early in the seventh century. And of course, there is also the argument that the Justinian plague had limited impact in the Arabian Peninsula. So the Islamic armies coming out of the Arabian Peninsula had not been subject to the plague, but whereas as they expanded into Syria, Egypt, they, in, and then to Iran, they in fact met states, armies that had already been weakened by the plague, and that may have been an important advantage to the Arabic armies in, this, in the seventh century. <clears throat> 
Okay. And here is one recent book um, on uh, the Justinian plague. You can see that uh, the emphasis here is not on a few years of the initial period, but the plague here is discussed in terms of a two century long period, and it's in the, very much in the same spirit I want to talk about the social and economic consequences of plagues um, this evening. Now, so let's say in the initial three, four year period, population declines significantly. Again, it, it changes from his um, region to region, but for example, in Egypt, in the case of the Black Death, and then more generally, in the Justinian Plague, I mean Byzantine Empire, Middle East, 25, 30, 35% was some rough figure. <clears throat> so it's a huge decline in population. And uh, unlike what Malthus had said, two centuries ago, recovery of the population was by no means automatic. There were all sorts of reasons why population recovery was not swift. For one thing, the plague kept coming back every five years, seven years, ten years. Okay? And the death toll in each of these episodes was significant. Secondly, again, to bring, different, bring together different kinds of literatures. Fertility behavior was not constant. In other words, families, women, their behavior not changed over time. Besim Musallam talked about birth control in medieval Egypt some years ago. He wrote a book in which he showed that women in, e in Islamic Egypt practiced birth control. And so when times were difficult, times were uncertain, we should consider whether women, families practiced birth control, that during difficult times fertility may have been lower, namely they, women had fewer babies, and this may have been one reason why population recovery was slower. So what we end up with in these cases, in these episodes, is centuries of lower population, centuries of labor shortages, and this is where uh, social and economic history comes in. And this is where I, am, I begin to focus on the economic consequences and the implications. We're talking about long periods of labor shortages and by implication, higher wages. And it's not only high wages, but all prices, relative prices change. Um, with fewer people and few less lower demand for food, typically you have decline in agricultural prices, especially in prices of plants and crops which require less labor. So there is typically a decline in the prices of cereals. But there is a rise in the price of all other goods, manufactures as well as agricultural crops, food plants, which require more labor. So relative prices change. Incidentally, interest rates typically decline, wages rise. Okay. So you can look at it this way. The plague is a terrible thing. Large numbers of people die. But for those who survive, times are better. Not only they have higher wages, but they also have 
they all inherit the assets, the buildings, the land, the tools of those who died. Okay? So, um, and there is a general shift. To, there is more wealth per person, and there is also a shift in income distribution from uh, capital towards labor. Times are better for those who survive because they have higher incomes. And that translates into um, changing new, different patterns of consumption with higher, not only higher incomes, but also higher levels of wealth, people, people begin to acquire new tastes, spend more money on high income goods, say, let's say, luxury, luxuries. Okay. So, I'll talk about the implications of some of this, but there is this kind of shift in patterns of consumption as well as wealth and income, you observe in, in most cases, all of all, all cases, most cases. And there, is all, there are also some implications regarding technologies. Periods of labor shortage force all societies to think of ways of dealing with them, meaning Periods of labor shortage force societies to find lab ways of saving labor in technology. Technological innovations that save labor. Okay. So, um, again, all of this is very speculative, but um, if we look at the case of, well, case of Islam, but also the case of Europe, we see that this was a period when bigger ships began to be f built in 14th, 15th century Europe to save on the labor. But interestingly, the printing press emerged during the Black Death. And uh, I can't think of many other innovations that saved labor the way printing press saved labor. So perhaps we should think about those consequences. Having said that, I should also underline that um, there is nothing automatic about, well, some of these effects occur, but when it comes to some of the others, especially the technological uh, innovations, there is nothing automatic. that. Each plague interacts differently with, with the environment and the institutions. So, we, well, we can talk, say that the relative prices change, wages rise and so on, and the consumption in luxury goods uh, increases and so on, but we can't really say we can't really say anything about technological innovations, long-term prosperity, and so on. These vary from one society to another. So I want to show you, take you th quickly through some uh, graphs I have helped uh, develop over the years um, regarding the long-term consequences of plagues. These are graphs about wages. We economic historians over the last 20, 30 years have uh, been focusing for very long-term comparisons of different societies and different economies. We've been focusing on the wages of construction workers, exactly the kind of people who built these buildings here in the 19th century, masons but also unskilled construction workers. This was a standard occupation. Okay? Um, and the wages of construction workers is 
often assumed to be somehow related to wages, uh, to the incomes and productivity in agriculture. We can argue about that. But the point is that as a result, um, wages of construction workers is taken in my, um, my profession as uh, reflecting the general the income level in society. We don't have detailed data about average income levels, different income levels of different groups of people. What, what we do have detailed data, even for the early centuries of Islam, on the wages of unskilled workers. And uh, so this, this kind of wage data allows us to make long-term comparisons of different societies, different economies. This is about um, uh, wages in European cities to which I added. These are collected by uh, a colleague of mine, Robert Allen, who was a professor at Oxford for many years. He's now working at Abu Dhabi, and so he's getting interested in the economic history of the Middle East. And I've added to that his, his data, wages from Cairo and Istanbul. You can see something very interesting here uh, in early modern Europe. Wages, both in Middle East and Europe, increased sharply up to the uh, middle of the 15th century. And then in most of Europe and the Middle East, this lower half of the graph, you see wages declining back to their initial level. They shoot up after the initial impact of the plague, and then as population slowly recovers, wages decline. With the exception of Northwestern Europe, Britain, England, the Dutch, um, and, the, and the, in, in, in Belgium, wages stayed. And then we see this divergence. But uh, divergence all the way to the Industrial Revolution. And so this diver divergence between Northern Europe and Southern Europe and the Middle East go back to the era of the plague. But what is common in, in this uh, graph is the sharp rise in wages in the 14th century when the plague started, and the wages remain high until uh, the second half of the 15th century. Then I, <coughs> I uh, put together this graph from data on uh, uh, Egypt, Cairo. Interestingly, we don't have data on medieval Europe, on wage data, price data, but we do have price and wage data for Cairo, Fustat and Cairo in the medieval era, so we can draw this graph. The Europeans cannot draw this graph, but historians of this region can draw this graph. At least for the moment, we can do this. So you can see this peculiar shape. You see these, each of these big episodes of, of the plague led to a sharp rise in wages, purchasing power of wages in terms of bread or wheat, and then there is a decline in each case. But uh, the, the, the rise happens very quickly, but the decline is very gradual, literally taking centuries. Okay? And uh, here is another graph I have drawn over the years. Um, it's not only Cairo here, but I have added Istanbul and Baghdad. You can see the same shape, and this time I take it all the way to the Roman era. The last, it's a, this is a graph of wages for 2,000 years. Okay? Again, this peculiar shape, the plagues come in, shoot the wages up uh, in Cairo, Baghdad, Istanbul, and then they come back. But interestingly, um, in the case, um, <coughs> High wages persist. In the, okay, let me go back to this one, okay. 
Macri, El Macrizi talks about how wages doubled in Cairo in the af during and aftermath of the Black Death. But there has been, we, we have evidence that wages then declined, and Stuart Borsch has argued recently that labor shortages were not very good for Egypt because under severe shortages, it was very difficult to maintain the irrigation canals and, along the Nile. And with the, the, this, with the irrigation canals falling into disrepair, productivity in agriculture began to decline, hence a decline in overall incomes. And then you, have, you see the decline in wages. But the, the story is perhaps a bit different. I mean, this is, let's say, a hypothesis. This, there is still a debate on this one. But you can see in the next graph, I have the computer has decided to go on strike. Hmm? It says, has a bug, yes. Well, let me just say that um, the plague, in the case of Istanbul, for example, the plague shut up the wages, and then we, okay, yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. You see that wages in, in the year 1800, three, three centuries later, were still lower than their levels in 1500. In other words, for the next three centuries, because the Black Death uh, well, Black debt remained in the region, wages remained high, okay? um, but wages in 1500 remained higher than they were in, in uh, 1500. With respect to this uh, earlier period, this rise in wages in during the earlier period, the six, seven, eight centuries in Cairo, is in, part, is in part due to the rise in nominal wages, but it's also due to the fact that wheat and bread prices declined sharply. So ultimately, we're talking about the purchasing power of wages. So when, if price, cereal prices, wheat prices, Bread prices decline, purchasing power of wages are still rising. And this is also due to a second cause. In the, uh, in the Byzantine era, Egypt was exporting large amounts of cereals to Constantinople. In the, seven, in the sixth and in the seventh century, these exports diminished. Some people have argued it was because the Muslim armies disrupted the trade. But no, I think there is another perspective here. The plague reduced the population of Constantinople, which in the sixth century was the biggest city in Europe. The plague had re reduced the population of Constantinople so much that it did not need any more the wheat exports from Egypt. And hence, with the collapse in demand, export demand, you have a big sharp decline in wheat prices in Constantinople, in, in Egypt. Okay. So, uh, in uh, the remaining uh, 10 minutes I have, I want to talk about the implications of all of this, this environment of labor shortages, high incomes, high wages, for the early centuries of Islam. After all, when we talk about the 7th, 8th, ninth centuries, we're talking about the era of the Islamic empire, the Islamic golden age. And uh, roughly this era. And I am very much focusing on Egypt, 
Syria, Levant, and Iran, uh, Iraq and Iran. Okay? And I just want to remind you that the early centuries of Islam was not only a period of prosperity, but it was a period of prosperity combined with a period of labor shortages and high wages. So I would like to speculate a little bit and also provide you some evidence how that interaction may change our understanding of the early centuries of Islam. Now, we know there is a lot of evidence that uh, um, the, the so-called golden age of Islam was a period of high incomes. And high incomes for these kinds of early societies has to mean higher productivity in agriculture because most of the people earn their living in agriculture. Agriculture must do well for a society in these early centuries, pre-modern societies, to prosper. So in uh, golden, during the golden age, of, uh, golden age of Islam, agriculture was irrigated, highly productive, and it, there was also a good deal of long-distance trade, all of which led also to very high urbanization rate. Baghdad was a very large city, okay? um, 300, 400,000 people. Okay? And so then I want to talk about how this high level of productivity in agriculture and long distance trade may have interacted with this environment of labor shortages and high wages. For one thing, we know how Islamic armies began to import slave soldiers into their armies. This is, every, all historians are uh, aware of this, how Islamic armies had slave soldiers imported. To what extent this practice is related to these labor shortages, I think we need to explore more carefully. And of course, in southern Iraq, there were also slaves imported, black slaves imported from East Africa. And they were working in agriculture until the slave rebellion at the end of the ninth, ninth century. Okay? So again, both of these things, sl slaves imported into the army, slaves imported from East Africa for agriculture, they suggest labor shortages were important. High wages, high incomes also had other implications for consumption, income, and patterns of production. We know from uh, the studies by Andrew Watson, the, is the Islamic Golden Age was a period of new plants, many new plants, many food plants were brought in to uh, the Middle East because a lot of people could afford them because they had higher incomes. And we also have a lot of evidence about a lot of specialization in new branches of production, the rise of new occupations, new skilled occupations. Again, sign evidence that uh, high, perhaps it was the high wages that provide this. We know also that literacy was high during this period, use of paper spread, and large numbers of books, large volumes of books were produced during the era. We can also speculate to what extent the technological innovations in agriculture, food production, shipbuilding, textiles, chemicals, to what extent these were related to this environment of labor shortages and uh, high incomes. Again, something for speculation, but um, I think it's worth pursuing. To what extent this environment of high wages and labor shortages had an impact on the development of early Islamic institutions. If you look at this early period, 
women had a lot of rights regarding property rights, inheritance rights, rights to keep their earnings. Okay. These are on the books. To what extent this labor, the environment of labor shortages had something to do with the rise of or stronger rights for women in those early centuries, I think it's worth pursuing. So um, let me um, conclude. I've looked very quickly at the experience of the Middle East with the plague, the two episodes of the plague. One thing we could say is that this view of the early, the pre-modern period of societies living on the edge of subsistence is really misleading. We know these two episodes of the plague, Justinian plague from 6th to the 8th century, the Black Death from the 14th in our region to the 18th, 19th century, raised wages. So these societies were not at the edge of subsistence. And these demographic shocks, these uh, plagues raised average incomes to two times, three times subsistence. Again, to repeat, large numbers of people died, but for those who survived, somehow, their incomes were higher and they had access to greater wealth from which they could consume. And then uh, these, uh, these, this environment sh should uh, per force us to think how, how, uh, this, uh, how it may have in interacted with the, early, uh, with the conditions of the er early uh, Islam. How favorable conditions because of the conquest, because of political stability, irrigated agriculture, may have interacted with high wages and high incomes. But I should also add that not all plagues lead to the same outcome. Outcomes vary a good deal. What happens in Europe is diff very different. What happened in this region during the Black Death and what happened in this region during the Justinian plague are very, very different. So, my final point is, I think these episodes of the plagues have a lot to offer us in terms of insights into the history of this region. And I hope historians, myself included, historians in the future, will spend more time studying them. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will open up the floor for 15 minutes for questions. Kindly, uh, if you have a question or a comment, please be brief so we can move the questions around. Thank you very much, Dr. Shalka. My name is Tony Delvari. I'm a second cousin for Dr. Salibi. I'm the only relative here. I see Dr. Salibi. I'm a water engineer, graduate of AUB here, but very much interested in history and everything. I want to ask a question related about the wages. Do, why we uh, compare them to meat and not to gold? Dr. Salibi himself, he mentions in 1917 that the price, the price of one bag of wheat in Lebanon, in the uh, bar, in the uh, barcade, the shooting, in the closing between the British Army yeah. and the came one kilogram, came to one golden coin. Yeah. Uh, so the reference in this thing, I think it should be the golden coins. Number two, as I remember from my grandfathers and everything, and from Dr. Salibi and everything, there's always the reference to the golden coin. A worker daily wage is a golden coin. Etc. Etc. So I think uh, I'm just just. Uh, okay. I think the reference should be more than the about the golden coin in this regard. This is a okay. general. Uh, Let's take a question. Me, commentary. Yeah. 
If you, if you give me a piece of paper, yeah, I'll take, I'll take note. We don't need to forget that uh, Rebecca itself was the uh, place of Rome, the the silos of the the silos of Rome here in Okay. Okay. Two more questions, and we will pause a bit and ask more questions. Uh, Walid Marouj, Lebanese American University, a social professor of economics. Um, it caught my attention the your table on the population. Um, you can go to that table, please. So there is an influential paper published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, 2011, that argues that the population ex explosion, demographic explosion in Europe, potatoes. Is due to the potatoes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, that, that was introduced from uh, Latin America first by the Spaniards, yeah. then by the French. Uh, so, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> Who else? One more. But, okay. <laughs> I'm Mustafa Gut from Boaziz University, uh, doing exchange here this semester. And my question is about, we saw the outcomes can vary from society to society, but I wonder why the outcome for Byzantine Empire was bad, let's say, uh, whereas it was good, did good for the Islamic Empire of the 7th century. Thank you. OK. OK, should I try this? OK, um, about the golden coin. You know, ultimately wages are paid and bread is paid and wheat pray, paid in coins. So some, as you said, we can measure these in gold coins. But the point is um, prices change over time. Prices in gold coins, e prices in gold coins or grams of gold also change over time, prices and wages. Just as we experience, say, inflation in terms of the Lebanese lira, okay, or the dollar, there was inflation in terms of the gold coin. So when we say we w we're looking at comparing the purchasing power of the daily wage, that is a better measure because of this inflation. In fact, as part of one of my papers, I noticed we, I, I realized that there was considerable inflation in terms of gold coins from the 7th and 8th century to the 11th and 12th centuries. Prices almost increased by 50% or so. So there is inflation even in gold. For that reason, to do this in terms of the purchasing power of the wage, whatever, however much it was in gold, is the more proper method. Uh, about, but now, but the potato and more generally about uh, the, the, the different impact of the uh, plagues, Again, I don't want to. I don't want to say that the plague ultimately explains everything, all the differences. the The conditions of the plague, high wages, labor shortages, is one of many things in the picture. Um, we. We don't know why um, the um, potato was adopted slowly in this region, okay? Um, but perhaps there was the need. There was the need was less urgent for the potato, and one one important reason I suspect is that. When you look at these centuries, the Middle East did not have large population, and the population pressure and the population pressure on land was not as intense here as it was in other parts of Asia. 
And that's, I think, one of the reasons why po potato was adopted slowly. In other words, while, for example, that study shows uh, uh, potato made a difference in East Asia, uh, but they're talking about, for example, sweet potato there. Um, I, I think the pop, there was not much pressure on land. People were not going hungry because they couldn't find anything to eat. There were other reasons why population. In fact, overpopulation was not a constraint in this region. So I don't think uh, potato would have made as much a difference in this region. And, there, and again, it was, potato was also interacting with very different institutions, uh, and that also probably helps explain the difference. Um, I would say the same thing about Byzantine Empire or early Islam or late medieval Europe. Ultimately, these plagues interact with what is on the ground and with much, a good deal of institutions, political conditions, and the results can be very different. Even inside Europe, the north, northwestern Europe, northern Europe, and southern Europe behaved very differently in the aftermath of the Black Death. So for that reason, I and mean, Byzantine Empire had a much difficult time dealing with the plague, whereas early Islam had also all sorts of perhaps favorable winds, political stability, and as a result, they were helped uh, by the plague, or the plague put them on a specific trajectory, a specific model of development that favored these luxury goods, high income goods, and so on. So things can vary a good deal. Thank you, Professor Pamuk. I have a methodological question. Um, your speculations about women's rights and mm -hmm. this kind of environment of increased wages and increased income in relation to women's rights makes me wonder how you use or relate to the intellectual history data, right? So on the one hand, you have doctrinal or if you like ideational positions on, the, on women and, and all sorts of other social phenomena. And then you have this economic data. And how, how do you read across those two terrains, if you see what I mean? Well, um, it's not ideational. And I think I am referring to studies on Islamic law in the medieval era. Okay? And studies I have seen on, on early centuries of, on law and women's rights on early Islamic era show a good deal of rights for women, property rights for women, earnings rights for women. And uh, so the speculation is, again, I'm not an expert on this, but this is precisely the question that historians of law and Islamic law should uh, focus on. Could this, this very specific environment have had an effect on the rise of these institutions on the, on the specific legal trajectory during this? period. But I am not, I'm not providing answers because though that's not, again, that's not my area. I can talk much more certainly with much more, much more comfortably about incomes and consumption patterns and so on. Thank you very much for your talk. I'm in the Faculty of Health Sciences, so I've read a little bit about the history of the plague. Um, some of the writings on Europe have um, 
have really addressed the issue of how the plague has changed the social systems in Europe, uh, not only changing the labor uh, relationships, but also the social uh -huh. uh, dynamics. Um, and uh, some argue that it has precipitated the Renaissance and the weakening of the church in Europe. Have you looked at anything related to this in, in the Middle East area? And you know, has, has the plague ha had any effect on the power of religion and, um, and, and social um, hegemonic structures in, in the region? Mm -hmm. um, the, I, no, I didn't. I think it's an interesting uh, point. I can give it, I can tell you other things, hugely different. Each of these societies have their own social structure, institutions, rules, and the plague interacts very differently. You know, it's, it's been argued for a long, long time that the plague led to the dissolution of feudalism in England, for example, just as you talk about the dissolution of the weakening of the church. That, that doesn't mean that it will do the same in other areas, but I think the, you're raising the, exactly the kinds of questions that I think we should raise. My point is that most historians of this region, certainly the Ottoman, histor historians of the Ottoman Empire, have never had the Black Death on, in, in their radar. I'll give you another example. Again, political history, basic. I think the Black Death had everything to do with the expansion of the Ottoman Empire into Europe. Across Constantinople and into Europe. In Europe, the Ottomans in the 14th century. The, think about the timing. The Ottomans crossed into Europe only a couple of years after the Black Death hit the region. And they kept moving and expanding. And you will not find a single reference in Ottoman historiography of the 15th century on Ottoman expansion into Europe, in the Balkans, about the Black Death. In fact, I asked once someone in a lecture, let me say that my colleague had not heard of the Black Death, okay? And she had never considered this as a, as a possibility. But this is the kind of thing I think we, we need to think about. Um, I think your question is very helpful. I don't know the answer. But these are the kinds of big questions we should uh, keep in mind. And what, will, what happened in this region will not be the same as what happened in Europe. But it is worth thinking about how the Black Death may have played a role in the, whatever the outcome. In your opinion, would you compare the effect of the Black Plague in the economic and social sphere, social economic sphere, as a similar to have similar implications as, let's say, World War One or World War II, only in the social and economic sphere? Well, <laughs> do, do what? What is the what is the impact of World War One and World War Two? If you tell me that, perhaps then I can answer. <laughs> because World War I and World War II, are very, they had very complicated effects. I can tell you that they had, World War I and World War II had all sorts of very complicated effects on technology, uh, state organization, okay? mobilization of resources, and so on and so forth. Um, they were big events. In that sense, yes, these are also very big events. But I should all, but also remember, World War I and World War II, by the standards of the plague, were short events. Each lasted four years. 
Well, I'm talking here about two episodes, each of which lasted two, three centuries. Okay? So, big events, a lot of change, um, I can't put a number on them, <laughs> How, which one was more important. But I'd say that they were also very, very important. And, and also I would add that World War I was also an unexpected event. You know, in World War I, for a long time, all sides kept thinking that the, world, the war would end in a few weeks, in a few months, but it didn't. So the black that there is a similarity there, it kept on coming back. Thank you, Dr. Pomov, for this very insightful uh, lecture. Uh, and uh, I have a remark uh, in some ways uh, that uh, probably makes you realize that the impact of your lecture on me this evening. Uh, in, in the way we study early Islamic history, we don't really in the way we study early Islamic history, uh, are, uh, yes. we, we do not uh, usually uh, reflect on the impact of the Black Death. And here, uh, in the very early of the conquest, there was a serious uh, incident that uh, reopened the plague uh, Tahuna West that worked out some of the leadership of the Muslim army. And that prepared the way for uh, 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 Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan to become the governor of Syria and subsequently to become uh, caliph. Uh, I don't think there has been serious studies done on whether it had an impact on uh, reducing the thrust of the conquest. Uh, it doesn't seem that all our evidence comes from later. But in caveat, there is something else that I want to mention here. Uh, that when uh, Caliph al-Walid was building the Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem and uh, his palace, which is under the Aqsa Mosque, uh, he asked for laborers from Egypt, Christian laborers from Egypt. And we have actually papyri that mention uh, requests that he sent and answers from a patriarch in southern Egypt uh, who seemed to be displeased that badly needed laborers are to be sent somewhere else. And now I'm putting the two together in terms of shortages uh, that might explain one why, such a bizarre demand, why you are in Damascus building a structure in Jerusalem needing laborers from uh, southern Egypt. Uh, so that might help explain uh, labor shortages and need to look elsewhere. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any more? Last question. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, lecture. I tell, tell I teach actually this sort of stuff to development students. Um, uh, Kamal Zanibi's uh, erstwhile colleague Lawrence Conrad actually looked at the first plague, the plague of Justinian, and one of the things he pointed out was that perhaps the Umayyad palaces, which are built in the desert, were a strategy for escaping the plague which hit the cities and the settled areas much more strongly. So my question to you would be, would it be better to actually pursue the insight which he seems to be pointing towards, which is one of the environmental, uh, the environment as a conditioning effect on the plague, the presence, for instance, of pastoralism and, nom and nomadism, much more in the Middle East than in Europe, when you look at the differences, rather than dealing with this kind of uh, uh, new classical economic approach, which is basically about static allocation, and then you throw institutions as an addition. And of course, there are uh, Ottomanists like Sam White who've done precisely that. They looked at plague, but also looked at things like the shifts in the weather in the 17th century, and come up with much more complicated stories where you bring the environment into history rather than impose upon it a kind of uh, a different perspective coming from outside and coming from something like neoclassical economics which is completely static. Would it be a better approach to bring it through? That's not true. Um, <laughs> but no, and we can also go into Europe, where you see the big differences between East and Western Europe, which are a whole line of less orthodox economists, from Dobb to Brenner, uh, 
have actually explained in terms of class struggle rather than these, these, these market scarcities. Well, I think in a, in a few sentences you try you mix too many things all at once. So I'm having a difficult time trying to respond to all of them because all the things you talk about interact. For one thing, I don't think I'm talking about static comparisons. I'm bringing in technology and how the direction of technology, which once you bring the direction of technological change and the fact that the environment of the plague may have had an impact on technological change. You're not talking about statics anymore. It's very different. Uh, if there is an environment of labor shortages and it leads to new labor-saving technologies, then all these other comparisons do not apply. And also I have pointed out something else which, which makes it very complicated. I'm not talking about, in many of these neoclassical models, about automatic recovery of the population. Many of these, these models assume recovery of population and that wages decline. I am, again, I'm saying fertility behavior is also complex. It interacts with all sorts of things and population recovery is not automatic, so we don't know. Uh, I think there are many different models that help, but uh, you know, as let's put it this way, Danny Roderick says, I don't know whether you've read some of his latest books, Danny Roderick says the trick in economics, the, in economics there are all sorts of models. A good economist finds which model to apply to which condition. So if we apply one model to all the plagues, I think that would be the wrong thing to do. We have to find out what for each plague perhaps to find what kind of model to apply. Okay. Thank you. I would like to thank you Professor Bobo for doing this great lecture and I also would like to thank everyone who attended. Next year, we will be meeting you with the fifth annual Kamal Salibri lecture. See you next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for all your time. I am honored to have you here until the end of the lecture. Thank you very much.